uh, kind of answer some questions that you guys have. And hopefully you all saw my email that uh, Memo 1 is delayed till Wednesday because there's been some questions. So uh, we're going to talk about Lab 1 uh, later today. And then, so yeah, I can work and answer some questions. I'll go over just some of your general questions and some stuff for the coding as well. And then we'll kind of clear some of that up. And we're also going to go over the the memo format in more detail. So I made a little document for your lab memo so you get a, a better idea of what I expect to see you for the memos. Uh, but there is a lot to do today. I, you know, we're still not going to take the full time, but um, we're first going to go over the the lecture for today for memo or for experiment two. That shouldn't be too, too long because this experiment is actually uh, really similar to the first experiment. And then we'll go over the, the kind of the lab, you know, in VKS, so on that online uh, kind of procedure that we looked at last time. So we'll go through the lab. And then after that, I'll go over briefly the kind of data reduction that we have for this lab. But uh, we're not going to go over that too much because these two labs, the first two labs are so similar that the data reduction is also really similar. So we're going to be doing basically a lot of the same kind of stuff for the data reduction inside of MATLAB for the second lab that you did in the first lab. And then after that, I'm going to answer some of the questions that you guys had on lab one, and then we're going to go over the, the memo format, and then that'll be it for today. So there is a lot, so um, it'll be, I don't know, a little longer than most lectures at least, but this is because, you know, last week we had President's Day. So let me share my screen. Hold on, I need to change a setting here. see the setting I usually see. Okay, while I'm looking at this, are there any questions before we get started on the on the lecture for lab two? Okay. Yeah, I don't see the setting. All right, well, that's okay. Let's go to, let's go to this. I'm trying to pin my video. Usually I see an option where I can pin my video, but I don't see it today. Okay, so um, before we get started, I want to also mention that I uploaded the the data for the fracture diameter for lab one. So um, I forgot to upload that when I first uploaded the data for lab one. So if we go uh, to our page and we go to assignments and we look at experiment one. So hopefully all of you have downloaded the, the data by now because, you know, initially the, the first memo is due today. But again, for those of you that are late, the first memo is due on this Wednesday. So I added in the fracture diameter, or the, the diameter at fracture, so in this last column here. So you need that to calculate your percent reduction in cross-sectional area. Okay, it's really bothering me that I can't pin my video. Let me check one more time.
No, not here. I don't know. All right. Okay, so let's do the the lecture now. I'm looking at the wrong class here. Okay, so today we're going to be going over the resistance strain gauge lecture. So let me open up those slides here. Here they are. So again, this lab is going to be pretty similar to the first lab that we had. Uh, basically, we're going to be trying to find the same thing. So we're going to be looking at stress and strain, and we're going to make a stress strain diagram. But the method that we use to kind of go about it is different than, than uh, last time. So if I go, um, I'm going to go to VKS really quick, and we're going to look at VK, VKS in more depth later on after the lecture, but I want to give you kind of a visual idea of what we're doing in this lab. Okay, so our setup is, you know, we're still using the MTS Insight Tensile Testing Machine. So this is what we pretty much use in every lab. And we're going to be using a material or a bar that looks very similar to what we had in the first lab. So I forget what material this is. Um, I think we still use three, actually, three different materials, just like in lab one. But point being, it looks similar to what we had in lab one. But in this lab, we also are going to be using something called a strain gauge, which is what you see here. And basically, as, as the name implies, it's going to directly measure the strain. So it measures strain in a different way than we measure strain by using the extensometer that we had in lab one. So this is what it looks like hooked up to the jaws on the testing machine. And we're also going to be using the extensometer at the same time. So we have the extensometer hooked up, and we also have the strain gauge hooked up at the same time during the experiment. So basically, we're going to measure the deformation with the extensometer, and from that, we can measure the, uh, the strain. And then we also have the strain gauge here, which will directly measure the strain in a different kind of method, which we'll talk about in the lecture. And then we'll plot both of uh, the different results here for on a stress strain diagram and then we'll see the kind of differences that they have if if any which of course there's going to be some all right and then in the lab uh, this is what um, we use lab view for the strain gauge and it directly measures the strain so it'll show it in units of micro strain in the software here and I also uploaded the data already for lab two, but basically in this lab, you, we would measure it at different intervals. So every 100 pounds, you take a screenshot of the screen here where you can see the deformation from the extensometer, and then you could see the strain directly from the strain gauge. And you would get about um, like 10 points or something like that. And then we would plot that in our stress strain diagram uh, during the data reduction portion. Okay, so anyways, this is what it looks like, and, and we're going to do this three times, so we have um, more data, but we have the strain gauge here, and then the extensometer, and we're doing basically the same lab as the first lab, except also there's another difference, and this time we're, we stay inside of the elastic range, so uh, we don't fracture this metal bar, basically because we have the strain gauge attached to it, and we don't want to ruin that, so we stay inside of the elastic range. Okay, so let me share my iPad screen and then we'll get started with the, the lecture.
go. Still wish it looked better. That's always going to annoy me. I don't know why the resolution is so low when I share my iPad screen. It's like, looks like it's a resolution of like 720p or something. But <laughs> it doesn't matter. Okay, so let's uh, get started here. Okay, so again, we're going to be talking about the strain gauge for, for this lecture here. Okay, so um, first off, the strain gauge, how it measures strain is different than the extensometer. So remember, the extensometer, by itself, it only measures deformation. So we have these, these um, this gauge length that it has, and it can deform at the same exact rate as our metal bar once we are applying tension to it. So, so for that, we can measure that deformation and then we uh, convert that to strain and then we have the strain. Uh, but the extent or the strain gauge rather, it measures strain directly. So whatever we see on our screen in lab view is the strain that we actually have. So it does this by passing a current through this strain gauge, basically through these kind of um, foil like strips of foil and it'll measure the change in the electrical resistance and that resistance is going to be proportional to the amount of strain that we have in that strain gauge so we're going to go over some of the math behind it but that's the general the general idea so we measure the resistance and we can convert that to strain So you might see me either write gauge as G-A-G-E or G-A-U-G-E. Um, doesn't matter, it's the same thing. Okay, so this is going to measure strain by passing a current and then um, measuring that change in electrical resistance in those um, kind of thin sheets of metal foil in the strain gauge itself. Okay, so what this looks like, I should have showed you before on, on this screen, get a better idea of what I'm talking about here. So this figure here is basically, you know, just a diagram of what our strain gauge looks like. So these are the little metal strips that we have on the strain gauge, which are kind of adhered to the specimen that we have in the lab. So. So the electrical current is passed through here, and then we measure the resistance that goes through these uh, metal strips. Let's see if there's any other figures that I want to talk about right now. No, not quite yet. Okay, I might go back. Okay, so I don't want to write down too much um, stuff here. So, so again, we have uh, the metal strips. We pass an electrical current through them. We measure that change in resistance. Okay, so for the actual mathematical part now, which you don't need to worry about too, too much, but it's good to understand the background. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to ask any questions in your lab report on the actual mathematical theory here. But we're going to kind of go through this uh, first so we get a better idea of how we measure that change in resistance for the metal foils. 
Okay, so first off, the resistance for these metal foils, we're going to write down the equation for that, and then from there we're going to basically derive how we can measure that change in resistance from some voltage that we apply to the, to the strain gauge. Okay, so for this, we're going to have the resistance. That's going to be equal to rho times L over A. So rho, that's going to be our resistivity. L is going to be the length of the foil. And then A is going to be the cross-sectional area. So let's write this down. R, this is the resistance. Rho is the resistivity, so it's not the density, but it's the resistivity. We'll talk about this in a second. L is the length of the wire. And then A is the cross-sectional area. Okay, so the, re the resistivity that's in material property for the metal, the metal wire itself, and this basically tells us how much um, electrical, current, electrical current that it can or can't resist. So if we have a low resistivity, that means that we can pass current through it a lot easier than something that has a very high resistivity. So this is unique to each kind of uh, material that we're looking at. So one metal might have uh, a really low resistivity while another metal has really high resistivity. So I'm just going to add this on here. So how much current a material can resist? Okay, so from here we're going to assume that the metal foil that we have is going to be a constant volume. So remember that figure that I showed you a few minutes ago where you could see all those metal strips for the strain gauge? We're going to assume that throughout the testing that those little metal wires are going to remain at a constant volume, which isn't really true, but it's going to really simplify our calculations here. Okay, so we're going to implement this um, into our equation now because we have the length and we have the area for those metal wires. So now we're going to have resistance for the metal wires is going to be equal to the resistivity now multiplied by the length squared. And this will be now over volume. Okay, so now we don't have to worry about um, changing length and area. We only need to worry about just the changing length. So before we had two variables that were changing, so length and area. And now we only have one variable that's going to change, which is the, the length. So, uh, you know, again, technically the, the change in length is going to result in a change in area, which is going to result in a change in our volume. But we're assuming that the volume is now constant instead. So... There is going to be a change in length, so that'll be the deformation, and that's going to be, you know, related to the strain that we have in the strain gauge. But uh, to simplify the mathematical calculation for now, we're going to assume that the volume is constant. Okay, and then from here, we're going to take the log of both sides. Why? I know it's kind of hand wavy, but that's what we're going to do. And basically, eventually, we're going to get a, an equation here for strain directly that's related to the change in resistance. So take log both sides. So 
we're going to have log of r is equal to 2 log l, so that's our length, plus log of our resistivity over the volume. So I always, I didn't mention this, but I always put a little line um, on, along the center of my V for volume and velocity is just a regular V, but now we're not going to have velocity in this lab, of course. Okay, so from here we're going to take the uh, derivative of both sides. Okay, once we do that, we're going to have dr over r is equal to 2 times dl over l. And then we have plus 0 because we have basically a constant at the end there. So taking a derivative of a constant, just going to be 0. Okay, and so now we have dr over r. So that looks, you know, similar to to what you've probably seen in your physics classes and stuff like that. So we're going to say that dr is approximately equal to delta r, or the change in resistance. So now we're getting somewhere that's going to be pretty useful for us. And same thing for dl, that's going to be delta l. So we're going to make that assumption. So this is going to go to delta r over r. So the change in resistance over the resistance, that'll be equal to 2 put this down here, 2 times the change in length over the initial length. Okay, so from the first lab, we know that if we have the change in length or the deformation over the initial length, that's the strain. So now we can uh, basically substitute that in. So I'll say we know delta L over L is equal to epsilon, so strain. So let's plug that in. Okay, and then I also moved it to the other side. So we have 2 times strain is equal to the change in resistance over the resistance. And then I'll uh, divide by 2. So we have strain is equal to 1 half delta r over r. Okay, so that's going to be the strain that that the strain gauge basically measures. And it, it does this by, you know, using this formula here, 1 divided by 2, multiplied by the change in resistance of those metal wires, divided by the resistance itself. So this um, 1 over 2, this is going to come into play a little bit later on. This will be basically a... a uh, proportional constant that depends on the exact strain gauge that we have. So um, this uh, proportionality constant is, is a gauge factor, which varies from strain gauge to strain gauge. So for us, in our lab, I think it's 2.14. We're, we're going to get to that in a bit, though. And then, um, so that's just a constant. And then the change in resistance over the resistance, well, we have to measure that change in resistance, right? Um, so that's when we apply an external voltage, and then we can measure that change in resistance. So for this part, we're going to talk about how we can actually measure that uh, change in resistance on the strain gauge. So for now, I'm going to box this equation, because it'll be kind of what we're using later on, and we're going to modify it a bit once we implement that gauge factor that we talked about. Okay, so at this point, though, are there any questions so far? Okay. Okay, so the strain measurements that we are going to measure, if you remember from the first lab, they were really, really small, right? So the, the deformation that we have is extremely small. And remember, we're measuring strain by having some relationship to the change in resistance that we have on these metal wires. So this change in resistance, it's also going to be really, really small. So to do this, we need 
um, a good way to measure that change in resistance. So for us, we're using something called a Wheatstone Bridge. You might have uh, gone over something like this if you've taken the circuits class already. That's, I don't know, like 203 or something. So if you already took the circuits class, you might have gone over something like this. Personally, I don't know about you guys, but I hate circuits. But that's what we're going to talk about for, for a little bit here. Okay, so we're going to be using something again called a Wheatstone Bridge to have our different uh, basically resistors inside of this. And then we'll put a strain gauge in place of one of those resistors and then we can measure that change in resistance. So let me go down here, make a new section here. Okay, so again, this is going to be used to measure those really small changes in resistance that we have. All right, so I'm going to draw you a picture of what this looks like. You might have seen it when I was looking at my uh, lecture notes before. Okay, so this is going to look terrible, so um, sorry before. So we're going to have something like this. We're going to have one node here. And then we're going to have four resistors in the, in the beginning, basically. So here we have one resistor. Okay, so we have our four resistors there, so I'm going to call this R4, this will be R3, R2, and R1. And then here we're also going to have a place where we can measure the output voltage. Okay, and then over here we're going to have the uh, voltage excitation for this Wheatstone configuration here. Let me move this down. Okay, so here's where we're going to apply the uh, excitation for the voltage for this Wheatstone configuration. Okay, so the first thing that we have is an equation to actually measure the output voltage, which again, if we can measure the output voltage, this will be related to a change in resistance that we're going to have in this configuration. So it, it'll be more clear in a second here. I know right now it seems kind of, I don't know, pretty, pretty vague, but it'll start to come together in, in a few minutes. So to measure the output voltage, okay, so this is going to be equal to the excitation for the voltage that we have. And then this will be multiplied by R3, so the resistance for our third resistor over R3 plus R4, and then minus R2 over R1 plus R2. Okay, so this is our equation here, but um, something that'll, look, that'll make a bit more sense now is if we look at our Wheatstone uh, configuration that we have here, if R2 over, or sorry, if R1 over R2 is equal to R4 over R3, 
if those are equal, then our uh, voltage, our, our output voltage is gonna be equal to zero. So we're gonna have something called a balanced bridge. Um, so that itself isn't gonna be very useful to us to measure strain because all of those resistance values are the same. You know, we wanna measure a change in resistance here. So what we're going to do to measure that change in, in resistance is replace one of the resistors that we currently have with a strain gauge. And once we do that, we're going to have an unbalanced bridge, and then we can measure uh, the value in that change in resistance. Okay, so again, if R1 over R2 equals R4, over R3, then we have a balanced uh, bridge. So again, our output voltage will be equal to zero and that indicates a, a balanced bridge. And again, we want an unbalanced bridge to actually measure the some change in resistance. So to do this, we're going to replace some resistor with a strain gauge instead. Okay, uh, any questions on this so far before we continue on? Okay, so what I'm gonna do is replace uh, R1, so resistor one with the strain gauge. Okay, so now I'm going to rewrite our equation for the output voltage here. This is going to be equal to the voltage excitation multiplied by the, uh, the third resistor over R3 plus R4 minus R2. And remember, we are replacing the first resistor with our strain gauge. So I'm going to put SG, and that will stand for a strain gauge and then plus R2. Okay, so this is how we're going to measure that output voltage for this Wheatstone bridge. And again, this is gonna allow us to measure that change in resistance that we have because this is now an unbalanced bridge. And from this relationship for our change in resistance, we're gonna be able to measure the, the strain that the strain gauge is, uh, is undergoing. Okay, now we're gonna go back to kind of reality. So in the beginning, we said that we were going to assume that the volume that we have for our strain gauge, for those metal wires in the strain gauge, we assumed that it was constant before. And that helped us with our, our calculation to keep that um, more simple, where we only had one variable, which was the length that was changing, and not the length and the area that was changing. So that helped us simplify our calculation when we uh, we're differentiating things because we had a constant and taking the derivative of that was zero and that allowed us to get our nice looking equation here where the strain is equal to one half multiplied by that change in resistance over the original resistance that we have. But again, we're going to be going back to kind of reality here and um, acknowledging that we don't have this constant volume. But, um, you know, not too bad because we're going to be using a calibration value or basically another proportionality constant, which I mentioned before was something called the gauge factor. 
which uh, depends for whatever string gauge that you have. So basically, um, each string gauge has its own unique sen sensitivity to strain, and the manufacturer will uh, basically look at that unique sensitivity for each string gauge, and they will give you a value for this gauge factor that you have. Okay, so this was um, this kind of this value that we have here, just to get an idea of when it actually comes into play in our equation here. Um, I'll show you from a previous uh, formula that we had. So this um, value it comes in this formula right here. So once we add this equation, instead of having two times log l. Uh, basically, we're going to have our gauge factor there. So this will actually go to log r equals gf for gauge factor times log l. And then we have plus log of the resistivity divided by the volume. Okay, so let's go back down here. Okay, so we're gonna take our, our gauge factor that we now have and we're gonna plug this in to the formula that we had from before. And then we'll kind of rearrange some things and then we'll get um, a nice expression for the, um, for the strain that we're gonna measure. So the gauge factor is equal to the change in resistance divided by the resistance over the change in length divided by the length. <clears throat> so we're just plugging this in from some equations that we had before. And I can instead say that's delta R over R over the strain, because again, delta L over L is a strain. So now let's rearrange this to have an expression for strain. So this will be epsilon equals one over GF for gauge factor multiplied by delta R over R. So this is just basically a slight modification to what we had earlier that we boxed right here. So before we had one over two multiplied by delta R over R um, but remember that each strain gauge has its own unique uh, sensitivity to, to strain. So because of this, we're not going to have 1 over 2. We're going to have 1 over some gauge factor. So let's box this. And for us, the gauge factor is going to be 2.14. So the strain gauges that we have at school that we use for this experiment have a gauge factor of 2.14 instead of the um, ideal theoretical value of 2 that we saw earlier on. Okay, so that's basically the theory on how we can uh, record the, the, the strain. So, you know, basically in the lab, you, you actually don't have to use this formula, right? Because behind the scenes, all of this is being done. So basically there's an, an uh, there's a voltage excitation that uh, where we have inside of our Wheatstone bridge configuration here, we have our strain gauge that's, for example, it's replacing this first resistor here, and that leads to an unbalanced bridge and from that, we can measure the, the output voltage, which has a relationship to that change in the resistance now. And from that, it's going to basically measure the, the strain. And LabVIEW, the software that we're using, is going to take into account this gauge factor that we have. And it will multiply that by our change in resistance. So basically, it's doing all of this math behind the scenes, which is obviously really good for us, right? So all we have to do is look at the value that we see on lab view for the micro strain that's being recorded. And then we can directly take that strain value and plot it um, against the stress value and we can get our stress strain plot. 
So, you know, really simple in the end, but it's good to know what's actually being done behind the scenes here. Okay, uh, any questions so far? Okay. So, there are going to be um, a few issues for the strain gauge, at least in this current, uh, this current configuration that we currently discussed. There would be some issues. The biggest one is that um, it's sensitive to temperature changes. So, if there's a change in temperature, those thin uh, metal wires, they're actually going to deform. They're basically going to expand. And because they're expanding, there's some deformation that's going on. So really, it's um, already um, expanding and there's already strain going on because of that change in temperature. So basically, we need a way to deal with that. Okay, so changes in temperature. Cause deformation. And the metal wires. So before I said that it was expanding, but really, um, that's, that's, you know, for one case. So if our temperature is increasing, then it's going to expand. If our temperature is decreasing, it's going to contract or kind of compress. So it depends on whether the temperature is increasing or decreasing. But either way, there's going to be some change in length on those metal wires. So the strain gauge itself is experiencing some strain that we um, don't want to kind of take into account because the the deformation that is occurring on the metal specimen itself, unless it's the same material as the metal wires of the strain gauge, they're going to be deforming at different rates. So we want a way to cancel out or not look at the deformation that's actually going on on those metal wires on the strain gauge itself. Right, because we only want to look at the deformation that's actually um, occurring on the metal specimen that we're testing. Okay, so um, by itself, the manufacturer, they try to uh, apply some material um, onto the, uh, on the strain gauge itself to help prevent from thermal expansion, but that doesn't completely remove that sensitivity that it has to changes in temperature. So to, to kind of minimize this effect that temperature will, will have on the strain gauge, there's actually two strain gauges that are going to be used in our Wheatstone bridge. Okay, so basically we have two strain gauges and what they're going to be, one of them will be an active strain gauge that we have. So that'll be actively recording a change in resistance to then convert that change in resistance to strain. And then the other strain gauge is going to be um, a dummy strain gauge. So basically that'll be there um, as a dummy strain, strain gauge, which will, it'll make more sense in a second here. So let's first draw this out. So we have our strain gauge here, or basically where our strain gauges are going to be applied to the metal specimen itself. So this first one, this is going to be the dummy gauge. And then over here,
we're gonna have the active gauge. So poor demi gauge, he's being insulted, but he's actually, you know, doing a purpose here. Okay, so we have our dummy gauge, and then we have our active gauge. And basically, you can notice that uh, the direction for the strain gauges are different. Also, there's tension that's being applied in this direction here. Okay, so the, the direction of the strain gauges does matter. So the dummy gauge here, it's placed transverse, or basically perpendicular, to the applied strain that's occurring. So... You see that we have strain that's occurring in this longitudinal uh, direction for this bar. So, you know, in this case, it's going left to right or along the longitudinal axis of this bar. So the dummy gauge is placed perpendicular to that. So it's placed perpendicular to this applied strain. So the dummy gauge experiences very little strain across those metal wires. Okay, and then the, um, the active gauge, it's placed uh, basically in line with the longitudinal axis, and that way it's going to experience a lot of strain. Or, or really, in this case, it's going to experience a lot of a, a very high change in resistance, which will then correspond to um, a lot of strain. Okay, but the temperature effects for both of these strain gauges, it's going to affect both of them in the same way. So... Because they're both being affected in the same way, we can basically record that effect and then we can subtract it out um, from the, the strain that's experienced in the active gauge. Okay, so let's write some of this stuff out now. Okay, so we have our dummy gauge that's placed transverse to the applied strain, and because of this, it's going to see very little strain. Right, and both of these uh, strain gauges are going to be affected by temperature the same. So basically, we're going to have some strain here. Let's do like this. So we're going to have some strain on this dummy gauge from temperature effects where it's either going to expand or contract. And with our active gauge, we're also going to see some strain. So it's either going to expand or contract again because of temperature but because we can um, because both of these are being both affected at the same kind of rate from temperature temperature changes we can subtract out that uh, that change in resistance due to the temperature from the active gauge and that way we can have the active gauge only measuring the strain that's on the on the material that we're testing itself Okay, so again, we're going to subtract that effect from the active gauge that we have for our experiment. So this does a pretty good job, but, um, you know, this is still ideal. And in reality, you know, things aren't ideal, right? So there is still going to be some effect due to temperature for the strain gauges. So keep that in mind for your report. So even though we're doing our best here by using this dummy gauge and this active gauge to... 
uh, kind of counteract that uh, change from or the the effect of temperature for causing strain, we can't uh, completely remove that effect due to temperature. So really, temperature is still a factor here for these strain gauges. So there still will be some associated strain due to changes in temperature. It, that effect is going to be very, very, very minuscule here, but it is still present. And it's, you know, a downside of a strain gauge. So that's something that you want to keep in mind for your report. So for the second lab, I'm going to have you talk about in the discussion some of the benefits and some of the negatives of both methods. So you'll talk about the benefits of an extensometer and the benefits and the negatives too of the strain gauge. And you'll kind of compare them and discuss for what kind of applications one um, method might be better than the other. Okay, so that's it for the uh, for the lecture for the theoretical portion. Anyways, uh, we still have more more to go today. But are there any questions on the theory? Okay, so basically to recap, uh, in a, in a very short way, the the strain gauge measures strain for our material by having an electrical current passed through the strain gauge. And that electrical current is going to result in a change in resistance on the on the metal wires that we have. And that change in resistance is proportional to the strain that's experienced on the material that we're testing. So to calculate our strain, we use this formula here. We have strain is equal to 1 divided by the gauge factor, which again is a proportional, proportional constant or proportionality constant depending on the strain gauge that we have. So in our case, it's 2.14. And we can use that constant to multiply by the change in resistance over the resistance, and then we get our strain. But for us, all we have to do is look at lab view and go, yep, there's our strain directly. So really nice in that case. OK, so let's now go back to VKS and we'll talk about the lab in a bit more detail. Okay, so here we go. Um, I don't have a video this time around, uh, but basically, you know, it's the same idea as the video that I showed you guys last time. The only difference is this time we also have a strain gauge and we're staying inside of the elastic range. So basically we can apply our load and we can then take that load off and all of these strain is going to be recovered for this material that we're testing. All right, so just like last time we're using the, the MTS Insight Tensile Testing Machine. So we have our top jaw here and we have our bottom jaw here and we're going to put our material in between these two jaws. <clears throat> okay, so we have two different programs here. So on the left, this is the program that you saw in the first lab. So this is going to record the load that's being applied on the material itself. And it's also going to give us the deformation data for the extensometer. Okay, and then that's in units of inch as well. And then uh, over here on the right, we have lab view, which is hooked up to our strain gauge. And you can see right here, it says strain comma micro strain. So we have units of micro strain and I'll show you the, uh, the data that we're actually given uh, after this. And then you will take that uh, data directly and you'll import that into MATLAB where you have both the extension data here, the load data here, and then you have the data for the strain gauge here. And so we'll go into MATLAB and then we'll do our conversions for, for this data to get stress and strain. Okay. So what we would do is um, we would uh, apply a preload. Let's see when they actually do that here. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself, I guess. So this is the strain gauge again, and you see that uh, it's applied here on the material. And then it has some leads that go to this box here. 
which will then go to lab view, where again, it's recording that change in resistance to get our strain. All right, so before the lab, what you would have done, of course, I'm gonna always say what you would have done, you would measure the diameter in this uh, center part here in three different areas, and then you would take the average diameter. And then from that, you are going to calculate the cross-sectional area. Okay, so here it is, um, our material is being uh, put inside of the jaws. Okay, and then we clamp them down. All right, here's our extensometer. So we're still using that in this experiment here. And there we go. So we have both of them applied at the same time here. So we have our extensometer, it's hooked up. And we have our strain gauge here, it's hooked up as well. So in the lab, I always, you know, in person, make sure that everyone understands that the strain gauge is really sensitive. So you need to make sure that the extensometer isn't interfering in any way with the with the strain gauge because or you need to also watch these wires make sure that they're free to kind of move because the strain gauge can actually be ripped off if you're not careful so it looks like in this picture here you can actually see um you don't see the g but it's over here it says that for this strain gauge the gauge factor is 2.12 but you don't need to worry about that because again that's taken into account inside of lab view Okay, so at this point, we're applying a preload. And then you would zero everything out. And then you would take out the safety pin for the extensometer so it can actually deform. And then you would press play. And basically, that would start to apply a load to the material. And we're going to be doing this for every 100 pounds that's applied. You also zero out... Uh, this dialog box and lab view for the strain gauge. And let's see, now it's going now. Okay, so you're gonna have 15 data points. Okay, so 15 data points in intervals of 100 pounds. All right, so there, you know, there's not too much here, right? Cause it's very similar to the first lab. So I know it's, um, I don't know, maybe it's not really anything new besides having a strain gauge that's also applied to our material here. But you do it one time and then <clears throat> you do it two more times. And then <clears throat> you would uh, make a graph for all three runs that we had. All right, so let's look at the data. So you, you can either go to files here and then go to experiment data or on the home page here. I think I put it in here as well. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so if we click on this, um, this is from a different instructor. This is from Dr. Sue from one of her past labs. So, um, you know, it's, it's a Word doc. And here you have the load. You have the extension. That's from the extensometer. And then you have units of microstrain over here. Uh, for the strain gauge, all right? And then, so you'd basically take all of these. So this is for the first run here. And then we have uh, the second run, and we have the third run. So you can either, if you want, you can put all of this into an Excel sheet if you want, and then you can import that into MATLAB, or you can just basically uh, construct this inside of MATLAB itself. So you can have an array that has all of the the values for load in one array. Then you can have another array for all of the values of the extension. And then another array for all of the values of uh, microstrain. And then from that, you can calculate the stress and strain from the uh, from our load data here and our extension data here. And then from that, all you do is just, you just plot it and that's it. So you're gonna be using methods again that are similar to last time. So at this point, I'll actually open up MATLAB and we'll look at some of the data reduction that you'd have to do. So I'm gonna open up my script from the first lab because again, it's very, very similar to what we're doing in that first lab. <clears throat> All, right. 
All right, before we open this up, any questions? different class here. Okay, so this is the script that we worked on last time for lab one. Move this over here. Okay, so here we had, uh, we calculated stress here. So you're gonna be doing that, you know, also for lab two. And then you're also going to calculate strain from the data that you have as well. So don't forget that to calculate strain, we have our deformation data, which is from the extensometer. And we take that deformation and divide it by two, uh, because we again have a gauge length of two, because that's the initial length from the extensometer. All right, so that's how you calculate stress and strain. And then you uh, directly have strain from the strain gauge as well. So the strain gauge is in units of micro strain. So you're going to have to convert um, the strain that you have from the extensometer into micro strain. So by just from this calculation on this line here, you see that the units were inch per inch, uh, but we have micro strain from the strain gauge. So if we were going to basically have consistent units here, we would need to multiply this by 10 to the negative six to have units of micro strain. All right, then at that point, all you would be doing is taking those 15 data points that you have and you would plot them. So you, you're gonna plot the strain that you have from the extensometer, and then you're gonna plot that against stress. And then you'll plot the strain that you have from the strain gauge and plot that against the stress. So very similar stuff here. So um, it's kind of, I don't lay it out a bit. You do plot the strain from the ecton extensometer, and then you would have stress. Then you would do hold on, and then plot strain gauge, strain, and then stress, and then hold off. So really quite simple. Um, but again, a lot of the the data reduction is very similar to what we did in the first lab. You know, all you have to do before plotting is calculate the stress and strain. Though, of course, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to reach out on Discord or stick around at the end of class today. So one more thing for the first lab, we'll talk about the first lab now. Um, I thought I went over how to have a text label during the, the, during the class, but I actually don't think I did. So, you know, for the deliverables, one of them is to label different points on your graph. So let's go here. Okay, so one of the deliverables that we have here is to label these following uh, regions. So I want you to label the elastic region, the elastic region, the proportional limit, uh, the yield point, or yield strength. It should actually really say yield strength. And then the ultimate strength, and then the fracture point. So to do these labels, we can either use the gtext command or we can use the text command. So gtext, if we put gtext and then in our argument here, I put UTS. So that's gonna stand for ultimate tensile strength. If I run this, if I use the gtext command, this allows me to place a label wherever these crosshairs are. So if I wanna put it for UTS, I can just I can just, you know, eyeball it and that's okay. And then I'll click down here. And there we go. It just placed a label for the ultimate the ultimate tensile strength. And then I also have um, another graph that, that I have here. And again, it's um, letting me place a label. Actually, I guess it's kind of bugging out here. But you can use that gtext command, again, to place down the label by yourself with some crosshairs. Okay, or you can use, yeah, okay, I have two different plots here. 
Okay, I'm going to comment all of this out. Also, you see I just commented out all of this here. To do that, I pressed uh, Control R. And if you want to uncomment all of these lines at once, you highlight, highlight them and press Control T. So it's different on a Mac. I forget what it is by default on a Mac. But if you're on PC or Linux, you do Control R to make a comment and then Control T to uncomment. Kind of helpful. Okay, so you can also use the text command. And for this, the first two arguments that we have here uh, is the x point and then the y point. So 0 0.02, you know, that stands for strain that we have. And then 2000 stands for the stress. And then the third argument is whatever you want the label to be. So if I run this code now, you see it's, it's way down here. Um, yeah, I put I put a stress value that's only 2,000 pounds uh, per square inch. Uh, but there it is. So let's do something more like, um, I forget how high it went. Yeah, that was, that was too high. Let's do 100,000. All right, and then there's our UTS value. So I would have to change this a bit here to be like 0 0.015. Is that better? That's a bit better, but you get the idea. So if you use the text command, you're directly going to specify the X point and the Y point, and then the label that you want. Okay, so that's how you do that. And there were also some questions on the very beginning up here when I used a variable naming rule and then preserve. So if you don't have MATLAB 2020B, um, I guess you can't use this uh, argument here. So you have to do something else. So I, I think I put this in the Discord, but I'll go over it now as well. So you can do instead read table, whatever your file is. And then you can do preserve, preserve variable names, and then, oops, and then comma true. Also, another way that you can comment out um, lines is doing a percent sign, then a curly bracket here, and then you go down to the point where you want to stop commenting everything out. So at this point, everything from line 10 and on is commented out. Okay, yeah, so I just wanted to make sure that I remembered the correct formatting here. So again, if you don't have MATLAB 2020B, you can use the code and line 8 here, and that should work for you. And it's going to do the same exact thing that line 7 does. All right, let me go back here. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to kind of let you guys ask any questions that you have on either lab one or lab two for the data reduction. And then after that, we're going to go over the format for the lab memo in a bit more detail. So does anyone have any questions for lab one or lab two? Yeah, do we have to write up the procedure since we didn't really do it in person? Uh, yeah, I'll talk about that once we go over the, the lab format, actually. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a question for the classic region. Okay. Um, like it says to label the the region. I use the area command to like shade in the elastic mm. region. Is okay. that fine? Yeah, that's fine. I didn't even know there was a command like that. that that'd be good. Yeah, okay. Okay, anyone else? Um, I know that in one of the first classes, you mentioned that we would uh, have to have pictures of the labs in our uh, memos. Since we aren't actually in the lab, are we still expected to put pictures in? Oh, no, no. If I said that, I, I think I probably just meant graphs that you generate. Okay, awesome. Yeah. All right, anyone else? Okay, if anyone has any questions, um, again, feel free to go in the Discord and, and ask there. Or you can email me, but Discord is often a lot faster. Okay, so I uploaded this file called lab memo format. So 
Uh, you can download this on Canvas. It's available there. I'm going to open it up on my computer though. Okay, so I made this document yesterday for you guys to um, basically be a little more detailed on what I expect to see for your memos. Alright, so it's kind of like a template and I also actually basically discuss what I want to see in each section here. Okay, so this is just the title page here. You know, it doesn't have to be exactly like what I have here, just something similar. So I basically made it an example for the first experiment. So put the experiment name, you know, the class that we're in, put our name, put the date that you submitted it, and then uh, put submitted to you, and then my name. Okay, table of contents. Um, I want you to have a table of contents that's actually not specified in the syllabus. So let me open that up really quick. So in the syllabus here, you know, it's not in here, but that'll be part of the formatting grade. So I want to see a table of contents. So you can do that easily in Word. There's actually like a built-in, um, I guess, function that they have in there or tool. And it'll make the table of contents for you. So have a table of contents that basically shows all the sections that you have. So the abstract, results, and discussion, and then the appendix. Also, basically what I, what I used here is LaTeX, if any of you are familiar with that. So if any of you use LaTeX or you want to start using it, I can give you um, a tech file myself, and then it'll generate this table of contents automatically for you as well. Okay, so we have table of contents. Um, you should also technically have a, a nomenclature section. I forgot to include that here. Um, but, you know, that's it's not in the syllabus, so I, I won't mark you down for that because, you know, that wouldn't be fair to you because I don't have that in here. But basically, I would, I would prefer to see a table of contents and nomenclature. But again, I won't mark you down because that would be unfair because it's not in the syllabus. Okay, so we have the abstract. So I don't think um, maybe any of you have written an abstract before, maybe a few times, I don't know. But at least when I took the labs before this lab, which was the physics labs, it wasn't even really a report that we had to make in there. So um, if you haven't written an abstract uh, at all before, uh, this will kind of help you out, and I would recommend looking up some abstracts as well. Um, but, but more importantly, after the first lab, once you turn that in, once you turn in your first memo, I'm going to give a lot of feedback on, on it, so that should help you out as well. But uh, in general, the abstract is around 200 words. That's not like a hard cutoff. If it's a little more, that's fine. But basically, you don't want to have like a full page for the abstract. That's way too long. So the abstract assumes that the reader has some knowledge on the field that's being discussed. So you can kind of imagine it like you're writing this for some other student that's uh, in mechanical engineering. So they have some knowledge, but they, may, they might not be taking this course. So you'll explain some things, but they have some knowledge on the field that's being discussed. Okay, and then this is what I basically basically want to see in the abstract. So you're going to introduce the experiment. So basically, what are we doing for the experiment? And then what are you trying to show or achieve? And why is it important? So uh, in reference to the first lab, why would it be important to measure the stress and strain of a material? Okay, so you're going to briefly mention that. And then very generally, what was the procedure? So for the first lab, I'm just thinking off the fly here, but you want to mention stuff like using the MTS Insight Tensile Testing Machine. Pretty long to say that, but uh, mention that. Mention that we had three different materials that were being tested. So we had 1018 steel, 1045 steel, and 6061T6 aluminum. And you want to mention the use of the extensometer to measure the deformation and uh, for what we were trying to achieve, that was getting the stress and the strain and making a stress-strain plot to look at material properties, right? So 
once we convert this stress and strain, that allows us to look at the properties of that material as a whole and not just one unique specimen. And then what were your results? So for, um, for lab one, also we only want to present major results for the abstract. So this part um, is uh, a little more subjective, but you want to have the, the most important results. So for this lab, again, off the fly, it might be something like which material was the strongest, so which had the highest U UTS, and which one was most ductile. And uh, were these results expected or not? And what do they tell us, and how are they significant? So there's, you know, a good amount of stuff that you want to include in your abstract, but the challenge is to make it concise. So again, you want it to be around 200 words, but that's not a hard cutoff. If it's a little more, that's totally fine. It just shouldn't be like a full page. All right, then we go down to results here. So someone asked about the procedure, right? So we don't have a procedure section listed out in the syllabus here. So we just have abstract, results, discussion, references, appendix, and formatting. So your procedure is actually going to be in the very beginning of the results section. It's not an in-depth procedure, though. So you see here I say, in quotes, a, a mini procedure. So um, I do this just because in other labs, you know, they might have you have a procedure section, but... All you do is copy and paste the procedure from the handout you're given. And in my opinion, that's not really achieving anything. It's just like a copy and paste and that's it. So what I have you do instead is this little mini procedure where again, you, you briefly, so take note of briefly, you briefly discuss how the results were obtained. So you're gonna restate the topic of the lab itself. So for the first lab, measuring stress and strain. Uh, mention the equipment that is needed. So we have our MTS Insight tensile testing machine. We have the extensometer, and we have software. So the software that we use is called TestWorks 4. Um, but you can just measure, uh, mention that we have software to measure the, the load and the uh, deformation. And then you will, in general, again, talk about the lab procedure. So you didn't do it in person, so I don't expect it to be perfect because, well, you didn't do it, right? But you can go to the VKS website that we've been looking at, and you can reference some of those steps in there. So we want to keep it general, so you can mention that we use, that we uh, test it for all three different materials, and, um, you know, basically we set it up in the inside tensile testing machine, we apply the extensometer, and we again, or we begin applying load until fracture. So I don't want it to be, you know, too long. It might be like a paragraph or something for this little mini procedure here. Okay, and then after that, then you're going to actually present the results that you have for the lab. So you want to include the numeric results and often tables are a good medium to have here. So you can think for the first lab, we have three different materials. And we want to look at the some things like the ultimate ultimate tensile um, stress and the um, basically the strain at fracture stuff like that. Um, basically, look at the deliverables handout that I had, and you can make a table to include all of those results there. And don't forget percent error if applicable. So for the first lab, we have some things that you want to look at for the percent error. So that was the elastic modulus, the yield strength, and the ultimate tensile strength. So these are things that you can either look up online for each material, or you can look at it in your book. It should be in your book. Uh, I'm not totally sure though, but you can just Google elastic modulus for 1018 steel and you should find it. Make sure that you cite your sources though. Okay, so that's important. Um, but yeah, you would put your percent error in, in a table like this too, if you want. Okay, and then graphs and pictures. So we had some graphs, right? So you want to put your graphs after the numeric results. And then after your graphs, you're going to interpret the results. So I really want to put a lot of emphasis on this part here. 
interpreting the results that you have. I'll occasionally get some students that will only put in, um, you know, maybe the numeric results, and then they'll put in their graphs, and that's it for the results section. But that's not um, good enough, basically. If you have a result, you should have some discussion on that result. So in the results section, that'll be interpretation. So I want you to interpret the results, so the numbers, but even more importantly, the graph that you have. So if we go back to, where's my code here? Here. So if we have this graph here, oh, I commented everything out, that's why. Okay, so if we have this graph here, you would put it in your report, and then you would discuss, or you would interpret this graph. So, you know, we have the numeric results and we have the graph. So I would say, you know, something like for 1018 steel, what was the yield strength? What was the ultimate tensile strength? And what was the strain at fracture? So we're going to be looking at three different materials, right? So you could, one method you could do is put graphs for all the three different materials. And then you could have an interpretation where you have, um, where you interpret all of those three graphs that you displayed. So maybe 1018 steel has a higher UTS than aluminum, which it should. And you'll mention that in your interpretation and also mention that that was expected because steel is more brittle and, and stronger than, than the aluminum. Okay, so basically you wanna look at the graphs and interpret them. So what are the graphs telling us as a reader? Okay, so if you have any questions on that, again, I'm in for all of this. Um, I'm always, you know, available to answer any questions that you have. And once I give you feedback too in the first lab, that'll help out a lot as well. Okay, so this looks totally random here. Like, what the hell is this? Uh, before, for uh, lab memos, I made like this, uh, almost an example report that I had for making coffee. Totally random, I know, but... Um, but I felt that was a little confusing, really. So here, though, is, is an example of a table and an interpretation for this data that I have presented in this table. So totally random stuff, I know. But basically, I, I have my table here. I also introduced the topic before the table was um, put in the report. And then after my table, I have this interpretation here. So it's about a paragraph that I have here. You know, your interpretations for some labs, they might only be a few sentences. For others, they might be a paragraph like this. But basically, I interpret all of the data that I have in this table. All right, so that's the results section. And then we move on to the discussion and conclusion section. So you're going to start this out by restating what the experiment was. And again, talk about why it's important or relevant to engineering work. So for the case of the first experiment, why is it important to know the stress and strain of different materials? <clears throat> then you're going to restate the important findings and results. So include the numbers once again for this experiment. Uh, you're gonna include stuff like the UTS and the ductility, so the, uh, the strain at fracture. So at, at the very, very minimum, again, on, on top of my head, I want to see which material was the strongest and what was the value for the ultimate tensile strength and which material was the most ductile. It should be aluminum. And what was its uh, strain at fracture? Okay, and then were the results expected? So if we see something like the aluminum wasn't as ductile as like steel, well, that wouldn't be expected. So... Uh, you would then expand upon that and draw some conclusions, right, on why that might have occurred. So you want to mention that, and then we, um, a big part of the discussion and conclusion is discussing sources of error. So I will keep in mind that it's harder to come up with sources of error because we aren't actually doing the experiment in person, so don't worry about this too, too much, but um, you should still be able to think of some sources of error for this experiment. So I'll actually give you one right now. Um, if the extensometer isn't 
perfectly perpendicular to the specimen, it'll have some uh, misleading numbers for recording the deformation if it's kind of skewed to the side or something. Um, so, you know, do your best for this part here, but I will be understanding that you guys weren't able to, to do the experiment in person, so I know it's a lot harder to talk about sources of error on an experiment that you didn't even do. Oh, sorry, I didn't see your, your comment there. So, thank you, Richard, for replying to, to Martin. And I'm, like, at the end, basically. Okay, so that's it for the discussion and conclusion. Basically, you want to expand on the results that you presented. So, in this part here, you know, you want to mention those major results that we have and expand on them. Include a lot of uh, discussion there. Your discussion and conclusion, it might be like half a page to a full page. You don't want to go too long. If it's more than a page, it's probably too long. But if you only have uh, like three sentences, that's way, way, way too short. Okay, appendix. You're going to have sample calculations. So for the first lab, you want a sample calculation for stress and strain. Um, elastic modulus. Let's see, did I include it in our deliverables file. I closed out of it. Yeah, okay. So I actually did specify what I want to see. So for your sample calcs, you want to have one for stress, one for strain, one for the elastic modulus, and then one for the percent reduction in a cross-sectional area. So I want you to actually type it out um, so go into Microsoft Word or, you know, one of the reasons why I use LaTeX is it's a lot easier to type out mathematical equations really fast. But this is what a sample calc should look like. So you're going to start it out symbolically. I know this is for the fluids lab, but whatever, right? So first mention the simple calculation that you have, and then you'll start it out in a variable form. And then you rearrange it if needed to whatever you're finding. And then you'll actually plug in some numbers. So for stress and strain, an elastic modulus and percent reduction and cross-sectional area, I only need to see one calculation per sample calc. So I only need to see one sample calculation for, for stress and only one for strain and, and so on. All right, so data sheets. Um, this is when you would attach relevant data sheets. So for this, you know, I I actually don't want you to copy and paste all of the data that we have because there's so much, right? It would be like 10 more pages or something for your report. It would just be insane. So what you can instead do is you can like take a screenshot or something or copy and paste into Microsoft Word the first few rows of data that you have for each material. And, um, and that's it. I don't really want to see, um, 10 pages of, of data. It's just not needed. So, so don't do that. You can just copy and paste like a few lines of data for each material. All right. And then the MATLAB code, I want you to include the script that you have at the end of the file. So here I just give a very basic, um, example. It's obviously not a full script here, but you can copy and paste your MATLAB code into Word. Um, at least I think you can. I haven't used Word in a while, so I can't remember. You can either do that or take a screenshot, or I think you can even save it to a PDF in MATLAB. I'm not sure, but um, students in my other class were able to do it quite easily, so I think you can just copy and paste your code. All right, and then that's it. So hopefully this uh, document here will help you out a lot for what I expect to see in the report. So just as one more re reminder here, your memo one or your first report is due this Wednesday by 11.59 p.m. Okay, so that's it now. So, you know, a little bit longer than a usual class might be, but uh, that's all I have for you today. So if you do have any questions, feel free to stick around. But um, again, that's all I have. So if you don't have any questions, then I'll see you on next Monday. Thank you. All right, thank you, Professor. Yep.
Have a good week, guys. Yeah.